Pali word for the worlds we create in our mind is bhava. Literally means becoming. We keep creating them. And if you look at dependent core rising, they're based on two things. The immediate prerequisite is clinging, upadana. And clinging, in turn, is based on craving, tanha. But it's interesting to note that both of those words have another meaning. The word for clinging can also mean feeding, taking sustenance. And tanha means thirst. The mind is thirsting for things, and so it latches on the, the five aggregates and tries to feed off them. In this case, feeling, perception, thought constructs. These are the things we feed on. What we're doing as we're meditating is to create a good pava, a good place for the mind to stay in the present moment. If you create a world for yourself that maintains its reference to the present, then it's a lot easier to see what else is going on in the present as well. In other words, you can see the process as it's happening. And that enables you to see through it, so you don't get misled by these worlds that you create. When you create worlds of the past and the future, though, you have to block out large parts of your awareness, so you can stay focused on that little world. That's why they're not helpful in the meditation. They're helpful to the extent that you remember things you did in the past, or you can anticipate the future in ways that help focus you back on the present. In other words, you can see times when you were mindless, not very alert, and you can reflect on the damage it caused. Or you can reflect on the dangers that await you in the future if you're not mindful and alert. This kind of thinking is helpful because it helps motivate you to get back to the present moment of develop your powers of alertness, to develop your powers of mindfulness. But if you want to see the process in action, you've got to watch in the present moment. So you create the world out of the breath, the sense of the body. Take the sensations that you feel in the legs and the arms, etc., and try to create them into a basis for concentration. place where the mind can stay, where you can have as your dwelling, and then a sense of ease that you can develop through the breath, even a sense of fullness you can develop in the breath. That helps to alleviate your thirst and gives you something to feed on. The texts actually talk about feeding on rapture. In the midst of a world of hungry people, the Buddha says, we feed on rapture like the radiant gods. And he's not just talking about hungry in the sense of hungry for physical food. When you look at what's going on in the world, you read the newspapers, and the magazine, news magazines, and you see what people are doing from their sense of psychological hunger. And it's not a pretty sight. So when we say that in the midst of hungering people, we're feeding on, ra on rapture like the radiant gods, it's not a selfish or narrow pleasure. We're trying to get ourselves out of that feeding frenzy. So this is one of the processes we have to understand in the mind. How does this happen? The Buddha says there are four ways of feeding inside. One is simply feeding in the sense of Sensual pleasure, sensual desire. 
you can think about situations that you would like to have in your life that would make you feel pleasant, that, would, that you would derive some pleasure from. You can think about times in the past when you had pleasures, pleasures you anticipate in the future, and the mind does feed off of that. It's also feeding on views, clinging to views. And then, as you probably noticed, there's a strong sense of me or mine around the clinging to that particular feeding on that particular kind of thing. I'm the person who has the right views. I'm the person who has views, understand things better than other people. My take on things is right. And there's feeding on certain ways of doing things. It's called precepts and practices, a particular way of doing things is the right way of doing things in and of itself. I mean, some of these things are part of the path. You have to have views for the path. You have to have certain precepts and practices for the path. What the Buddha criticized was the people who feed on these things as ends in and of themselves. And then finally there's feeding on ideas of who you are, your self-identity. And why does the mind feed on these things? Because it feels empty without them. Sometimes it feels lost without them. Where are your bearings? And we create our bearings for ourselves by our views, by our ways of doing things. What it comes down to is we feel that we need these things for pleasure need these things for happiness, and without them we feel lost. These are our means, we think, for attaining pleasure. It's based on that thirst, the thirst for pleasure, the thirst for being, or the thirst to destroy th what we've got. But all these things are motivated by that desire for happiness, by that desire for well-being. The thirst, in turn, is motivated by feelings of pleasure or pain, or neither, sort of a dull, neutral feeling. And these come from sensory contact. And so one way of looking at the processes in the mind is try to trace them back, exactly what contact triggered them. Was there a thought? Was there a sound? Was there an idea? that suddenly triggers you into creating these worlds. That's one thing you've got to look for. What are the triggers? And you find that the triggers can be very small sometimes. But dependent core rising digs deeper than that. It says it's not just the contact. We come to sensory contact with a lot of preconceived notions, a lot of issues ready to pounce on things. That's why contact is not the beginning of dependent core rising. Prior to contact, you've got the you've got the senses, and prior to the senses, you've got name and form. Name and form are crucial here, particularly name. It includes feelings, perceptions, intentions, attention and the contact among these things in the mind. This is why the Buddha focuses his, the practices of the path right here. So you've got to change your intention. You've got to change the way you understand things. Our basic approach for happiness is there's got there are things that you identify with, your sense of who you are, who's going to benefit from these activities that you're doing to create happiness, and exactly what things do you have under your power, under your control, that you can use to create that happiness. That's an issue of attention, how you attend to things, how you look at them, what your perspective is, what questions you ask.
And that big one, who am I? Do I exist? Do I not exist? That's a constant question. And we're always coming up with different answers. And because that question eats at us, then we try to feed on a particular identity. We create an identity to, to stuff into its mouth. But if you can keep reminding yourself, that's not, that's not the issue. The issue is simply, what can be done to lead to happiness? Which sometimes requires a sense of self, but sometimes doesn't. This is why right view is the beginning of the path, because the focus is on particularly that way of attending to things. Once you've got a way of attending to things, then it changes your intentions. Your intention should then be to understand, okay, what is the cause of suffering? What are the causes for the end of suffering? If I see myself doing something that leads to suffering, how can I stop? If I see that there are states of mind that lead to an end of suffering, how can I encourage them? How can I develop them? Those are intentions that you've got to nourish. Because otherwise, when the usual triggers for thirst and clinging or thirst and feeding come along, you just go right in your old feeding patterns. So to help strengthen the new way of giving attention or the new way of developing intentions, the Buddha has you develop certain perceptions. You've probably heard of the three characteristics. It's interesting to note that the term three characteristics does not appear in the Pali Canon. The Buddha talks about anicca, dukkha, anatta. But he doesn't use the word characteristic to go along with him. He uses the word perception. You learn to label things as inconstant, as stressful, not self. You l and there's the other connection he has is called anicca nupasi, dukkha nupasi, anatta nupasi. Is that you try to look for these qualities in your experiences. Particularly, you try to look at those raw materials that you ordinarily use to build your sense of yourself, to build your sense of the world. So you recognize the raw materials as being inconstant. When the raw materials are inconstant, how are you going to build anything solid out of them? It's like building a house out of frozen meat. It seems hard. You can stack it like bricks, but it's going to melt. Who would want to live in a house like that? When you see that the raw materials are stressful, you ask yourself, hey, what can I build out of stressful things that would re really provide true security? And when you see that they're not totally under your control, when they're anatta, what sense of reliable self could you build out of these things? You can build a temporary sense of self, and as we've seen, there are times when you need that. But ultimately, it doesn't give the satisfaction you want. Because these thought worlds, once you set them going, they start doing things on their own. They have a logic of their own that you can't always anticipate. And so how can you trust them? So these are the things the Buddha has you focus on. Attention, intention, perception. So that when you find the mind jumping at the opportunity to build a thought world, you can ask yourself, why am I doing this? What am I going to get out of it? You look at the raw materials and they're not 
the sort of things that you could build anything reliable out of. And you look at your motivation. Why are you doing this? What do you want out of this? And you start asking the questions, does this activity lead to suffering or does it lead away from suffering? These are the things you've got to keep in mind. And one way of doing that is to develop a good solid foundation here in the present so it's easier to stay in the present. The longer the mind stays in the present, the easier it is to be mindful and alert. Dig down a few more steps in dependent core rising and you've got fabrication. There are three kinds, bodily, verbal, mental. Bodily fabrication is the breath. Verbal is directed thought and evaluation, and mental is feeling and perception. When you're focused on the breath, thinking about and evaluating the breath, you've got all these things right there. You've got the breath, you've got yourself thinking and evaluating the breath, and you've got the feelings of pleasure and pain that come from the breath, and also those perceptions that keep you focused both on the breath and on the pleasures or the pains that come from the breath. When you learn to look at things in these terms and can maintain this world, okay, you're in a much better position to watch the process of how the mind creates those other worlds when it forgets when it tries to block out this world of the present. That's the ignorance that sets those other thought worlds into, into motion. So you've got to keep reminding yourself, stay here, stay here, stay here. Try to get as interested in the breath as you can. Try to understand, what is this breath energy anyhow? How does the in and out breath relate to the sense of energy in the different parts of the body? How can you create a sense of ease here that helps to satisfy it, that helps get rid of that hunger to go out and create other places, other worlds? Because a better sense of fullness you have here, as I said earlier, once you get the fullness that comes from learning how to relate properly to the breath, it really does cut through a lot of that hunger, a lot of that thirst that would force you to create other worlds of being, other worlds of becoming. So when you look at dependent core arising, it's not just an abstract analysis. It actually explains a lot of the ways, a lot of the reasons why the Buddha teaches meditation the way he does, why he tended to teach breath meditation more than any other kind of meditation why the path begins with right view, because it helps redirect this causal process away from the ignorant clinging and thirst that ordinarily we feed on, or that we try to feed on, try to find some satisfaction, and focuses in a direction where it provides more satisfaction, a greater sense of fullness. So it's not just an abstract map, it's actually a guide to what you can do to help abort this process of constantly creating unsatisfactory worlds in the mind, worlds that lead to suffering, worlds that lead to stress. It teaches us new feeding habits. We can find, when we've learned how to feed on the breath, We don't have to create those different identities that need to go out and feed on other people. And so this way, as we develop new feeding habits in the mind, it's not just good for us, it's good for the people around us. So develop a taste for the breath. 
Learn how to be a connoisseur of your breathing. Because when you learn to feed here, it really develops the strength, the very strengths of the mind. Conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, and discernment. It can strengthen it in ways to the point where it ultimately doesn't need to feed anymore. And that's a great gift right there, both to yourself and to the people around you.